today, today I want to bring you a message. Uh, it's called uh, Proceed with Caution. It's, it's all about idol worship and idolatry, but it's about a specific kind. And I want to give credit. I've been listening to a few sermons uh, uh, here and there, so I, I'd be glad if you ask me where I got stuff. I'm not saying all this is mine, uh, but I'm saying mainly I've, I've plagiarized off the normal people. Is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude. That's who I use most more than anybody else. Occasionally Isaiah or somebody like that. But uh, uh, anyway, proceed with caution. When it comes to uh, idolatry and the worship of idols as we sit through the Bible, uh, people bow down to statues. Now that, that may seem a little far-fetched and strange for us. That somebody would... Uh, uh, build a statue of some sort, bow down to it. It seems a little archaic, a little barbaric, uh, but it's exactly what they did. When you remember in the, in the Old Testament, Moses uh, led the people, the children of God, he led them out of Egypt in a powerful way in the book of Exodus. And uh, they're heading towards the promised land. But if you remember, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, his brother Aaron, the first high priest, he actually built a golden calf and all the people bowed down to it. If you think that's stupid, do your head like this right here. That's what, that's what Aaron did. That's what all the people of Israel did. Over uh, later on, he was uh, Elijah the prophet. We studied about last Sunday night, last Sunday night here. Elijah the prophet, he challenged 450 prophets of Baal. That's B-A-A-L. And uh, all these other prophets, they worshipped idols. And they thought their faith was real. They thought it was legitimate. It was not. And they were, it was proven so. In 1 Kings 17, fire fell down from heaven uh, when Elijah prayed to the Lord. Uh, we have this idea. People built, they built objects and they worshipped them. Isaiah the prophet writes about that. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 19, the Bible says this. Says, no one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of this wood I use for food. Fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Do you, do you have like this right here? No, they shouldn't have. And, and we so, I mean, we're so very much challenged. We'll say, man, aren't we glad we're not near as foolish as they were. Hold on to your hat here. Uh, over through the New Testament, uh, you see idolatry comes up over and over throughout the Word of God. Really, an idol is anything that comes in place of, in front of, uh, your relationship to God. Anything you do, you serve, and you put in place of serving God is an idol. does not have to be a block of wood or golden calf. It's, it's anything. And over at the end of the New Testament, it's a verse I'll uh, read here before we pray. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, uh, where John just writes this. He writes a great uh, book, 1 John's a tremendous book, uh, very much focuses on the love of God, the grace of God, that we're children of God, powerful, uh, 1 John. But at the end of this book, the last few verses of that letter, 1 John, you read this, 1 John 5, verse 19, Dear children, keep yourselves... From idols. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name now and forevermore. We're thankful for your, all of your goodness and kindness and love. and uh, We're thankful for those that love you. We're thankful for the building being full here at East Point today. Uh, we're thankful for all the kids. We had so many uh, just now excused for uh, junior church services. We're thankful for all of them. Uh, we know we have things coming up like our uh, Christmas program and plays and... Uh, uh, we need those kids here to participate. We encourage them to do that. And, uh, and we need families that encourage the same. And we just thank you for them. Uh, we're thankful for everybody here. We're thankful for an opportunity to sing praises to your name, to break the bread of life, and now to study your word together. Father, help us to see the danger of idols that we see uh, every day in our life and our culture. And may we decide to serve you with all of our hearts. We ask you for increase, increase in your church here at East Point, all around the world. We pray that you're glorified through us and in us. And we pray it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Here, uh, we're talking about idols. 
We're talking about people who historically they bowed down to wood and to uh, uh, golden calves and so forth. But we're talking about idols in our lives today. Now, the number one question you sometimes, or number one answer you sometimes get, if you ask people, a group of people, you say, why don't you serve the Lord? Why don't you serve the Lord in a greater capacity? Why don't you go to church? Or why don't you serve the Lord whatever capacity you want to uh, inquire of? Why don't you serve the Lord? Probably the number one reason for not serving God is I'm too busy. I'm t- I got too much stuff going on. I'm a busy person. And you know what the Greek word is for too busy? Baloney. That's, that's not really the Greek word. I made that up. Uh, we all say, we're all inclined. Man, I'm busy. I mean, you're like me. We got, we got kids. We got things going on. It's all we can do. Get out of the house in the morning. Get them to school. Get to work. Uh, get things. Get lunches packed. Get everything. To, pick them up from school. Got appointments. Got to go to the dentist. Got to go to the post office. Did anybody go to Walmart? We need milk. I mean, uh, it's, it's all this crazy stuff. It's all you can do on Wednesday night. Try to get something in your belly. Get to Bible study. It's crazy. It takes me on Wednesdays. It takes me three hours to get here for Bible study. What's your excuse? Uh, I mean, it's crazy. And then it's up. You're up at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Kids are up. Uh, bellies are aching. All this kind of stuff. Then you're up in the morning. Do it all over again. What do you mean, preacher? Tell me I'm too busy. I'm not too busy. We're all busy. But we make time for the things that are important to us. Now, I want to I challenge you. I want to challenge you to think about the world we live in. Do you know that the first uh, Google, Google was invented in 1998? Man, that ain't been long ago. If you remember 1998, raise your hand. Anybody remember? It? <clears throat> I'm not the only one. Um, Google was invented. Um, Today, do you know there are 10 billion, with a B, Google searches every day? 10 billion. Uh, There are more than 2 billion websites today, 2 billion around the world. Um, In 2005, the very first uh, video was put on YouTube. Very first video in 2005. Now, today, 2 billion people access videos on YouTube regularly, every day. In 2007, the very first iPhone was released. After the iPhone came a variety of smartphones, and now, does anybody not have one? Anybody? If you want to be smart, better get you a smartphone. They say that 68% of 18 to 34-year-olds, I'm out of that bracket, I'm too old. These kids, these young whippersnappers, 18 to 34, they don't go one hour, 68% don't go one hour without checking their phone any given day. 74% of 18 to 34-year-olds, their phone is the last thing they see before they go to sleep at night. It's the first thing they see when they wake up in the morning. 91% um, of people have their smartphone within arm's reach at all times. 68% say they wouldn't go anywhere without it. The average person will pick up his phone 80,000 times a year. That's a lot of phone picking up. Um... And, and you find an article, it's called uh, <clears throat> The Rise of the Toilet Texter. It's in New York Times. I did read the article. 75% of adults are on their phone while in the bathroom. Among those 18 to 35, it is 91%. 30%, I can't make this up. 30% of people say they would not go to the bathroom without their phone. I'm not going in there without it. Uh, 63% of people have answered calls in the bathroom. 41% have called others while enthroned on the toilet. Uh, It's time that we get the Lysol wipes out, people. Think about it. It's flu season. Flu season. Think about it, it infiltrates our days, it infiltrates our lives, our livelihood. It's all we know. And you got to wonder at some point, have we not gone from watching the phone to worshiping the phone? It's like we all have a little tiny idol in our pocket. I got one right right here. It's it's, it's like a little tiny idol, do you know? American, the average American spends three hours a day on a smartphone. You can go to settings. You go to your, uh, you go and check your phone statistics. It'll tell you how much you spend on the phone every day and where you spend it at. 
The average American is three hours a day. The average teenager, it's eight hours a day. Now, they're on a lot at school. But even when they're not at school, they're on their phone. And then if you sleep eight hours, you're at school eight hours, you're on your phone eight hours, that's, that's 24. Nobody has more than 24 hours in a day. Can you see what the problem is here? Our, our iPhones are proof. They are proof that we're not too busy to serve God. Even, even non-religious articles see the problem. Non-religious people see the problem. This also was in the New York Times. It's a non-Christian uh, platform in every way. Uh, the article said this. Says, they are the masters. We are not. The phones, they're, the phones, the screens, they are built to addict us, madden us, distract us, arouse us, and deceive us. We primp and perform for them as for a lover. We surrender our privacies to their demands. We wait on them for every like. The smartphone is in the saddle and it rides mankind. Even non-religious people see what's happening. How many times you go in a restaurant and you see everybody at the restaurant sitting there on a device? People sitting at the same table. And you joke a few years ago, are, are you texting each other? But now you can't joke about it. Everybody's on the phone. Um, it, it's a real problem. And I just, I ask you a few questions this morning. Uh, number one, I ask you to consider what do you consistently, what do you consistently sacrifice your time for? I mean, if you want to see what's important to you, what you worship, there's two things you can look at. You can look at your calendar and you look at your checkbook. I can look at you. If you have everything wrote down in your calendar, you have everything in your checkbook register, I can tell you what's important to you by looking at your calendar and your checkbook. But just look at your calendar. Just look, where do you spend time? Go to your settings. Look and see where you spend time, how much time you spend on the phone. It might humble you to realize how much time that you're actually on the telephone. You're looking at the screen. Would you even consider this idea of a phone fast? That would be not using your phone for a period of time. There was one preacher who, who took that to his congregation. He said, we're all going to do a seven-day phone fast. And some people did it. One guy, a few days later, he said, I'm so bored in the evening, I had to start working out. <laughs> he said, uh, I blame my preacher for this. <laughs> Would you consider a phone fast? Now, I know a lot of us work. We got emails. We got important stuff. We got to answer. We got things we got to do. We draft documents. We got all this. We got to have them some. But when you go at home at night, would you consider having a box that you could put in it so you would put your phones away so you could actually talk to your spouse? Or maybe your kids too. Actually have a conversation. Actually look somebody in the eye. Something meaningful. Where, where do you spend your time at? Uh, what gets your time? The Bible says, as it's painted in Genesis chapter 3, in fact the Bible, the Bible's a love story that God loves us. He created us in His image. He created us for His glory. And He desires, because of who He is and His love, He wants to have a relationship with us. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says in Genesis 3 verse 8, it says God came down and he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. That's the relationship he desired. The creator of all things with creation. And the pinnacle of creation, as the Bible states it, it it's mankind, it's us. God wants that relationship. He wants that relationship with us. And to have that relationship, it requires T-I-M-E, the time. You're not going to know God. You're not going to please God if you don't make time for God. Spend time with God. Look at your calendar. Where's your time go? Number two, uh, what's the first thing you think about in the morning? Now, uh, anybody here use their uh, telephone for an alarm clock? Anybody? <clears throat> that's what I got to do. Uh, that's my, that's my uh, waking mechanism of choice. My strategy is I got to put it across the room. I put it up on the... On the uh, uh, I throw out, I, I lay in bed at night and I throw it up on the uh, uh, thing with the clothes in it. What am I talking about? <laughs> dresser. I throw it up on the dresser chest there. <laughs> I, I throw it up there and it goes off in the morning. If my feet hit the ground, it doesn't matter if I just get an hour of sleep, two hours of sleep. If my feet hit the floor, I'm up. But if I can reach that telephone, man, Lord have mercy on me. I don't know what's because I hit the button. I don't know if it snoozed or turned it off or whatever. I mean, that's what happens. What's the first thing you think about in the morning? 
There's so much. There, there's what's called nowadays, it's, it's FOMO. It's F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. It's called, uh, some people call it ego, ego candy. Uh, they want to know, uh, uh, they want to know what other people have said about them while they're sleeping. That's your ego. You want to know uh, this idea of what happened last night. You don't, want to, you don't want this novelty that somebody else knows something that happened before you know it. So you want to get on there and check it out. And, and it's this idea. Some people, first thing in the morning, they, the phone goes off, the alarm goes off, they get the phone so they can be entertained as soon as they wake up. And, and they want to fill their minds with just everything, and it's all out there. It's at the click of a button. And the Bible says to us, in Psalm 5, verse 3, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. Uh, that's what the Bible says what we should do in the morning. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Uh, thirdly, uh, where do you turn... Where do you turn for comfort when you're hurting? When you're really bothered? If you've had a, a fight with your spouse, an argument, uh, where do you turn? Do you not know people sometimes in the middle of a lot of stress, stressful situation? They go to the phone, they go to social media, and they scroll for hours blankly. They, wait, they waste an hour of time and say, man, what am I doing? Why do I just keep hitting that button? Why can't I stop? Help me. That's what people do. Sometimes when they're all stressed out, they go to Amazon. That, that dude is the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos. Because uh, some people get stressed, they go to Amazon, they buy something. Got to buy something, man. I had a rough day. Uh, where do you turn when you're hurting? Consider it. Um, do you know, people, people there's a 60% rise, 60% increase in the best blank for me. So people are searching in Google and they say, what's the best job for me? They type it in the browser. What's the best job for me? What's the best haircut for me? What's the best uh, dinner for me to fix tonight? What's the best? They're asking Google. But do you know that if you hit like eight times on social media, you hit eight, like, hit the button like eight times, and they can predict with 97 percent accuracy what you like and what you don't like. Man, that's scary, ain't it? What's best for me? There's an 80% increase in should I blank. Should I cut my hair? Should I go to the doctor? Should I go to the emergency room? Should I quit my job? Should I ask for the promotion? Should I? People are asking Google to tell them. You see what's happening. People are saying, hey, hey Siri, instead of hey God. You see what's happening? You see what's taking place? Man, we're way too, way too sophisticated bound down to a block of wood, I'm telling you. Um... You hear what the Bible says in Proverbs 3. It says, uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Uh, fourth question, where do you turn for satisfaction when you feel empty? Oh, well, when you're just empty, you're looking for something, some satisfaction, some sort and some kind. Where do you turn to? Is it, is it YouTube? Am I the only one here It's wasted time watching random videos on YouTube, people falling down? <laughs> Am I the only one done that? We, we turn to YouTube, we watch. It, it's different things. Uh, for some folks, it's, it's pornography, pornography websites. Do you know that uh, there are, evidently there are like 10 million porn accounts on Twitter? 10 million. Uh, some of the coal companies in the United States, I'm familiar with coal companies, and some coal companies, they got workers in different states that produce as much coal as they can, sell it for as much as they can. And they can make one company, one nationwide company, made $2.3 billion selling coal a couple years ago. $2.3 billion. The pornography industry in America makes $12 billion a year. It's $97 billion around the world. Gets more traffic than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter every month. It's pornography. People, they just want to feel better. They don't want to feel alone. They want some satisfaction. And they're looking and they're not getting any. There's no satisfaction there. It's like the sailor who was lost at sea and what he says is water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. There's no satisfaction there. And the Bible's saying in Psalm 17 verse 15, in righteousness I will see your face. When I wake I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. The only satisfaction there is is found in what God offers through Jesus Christ. It's the only purpose you find, the only meaning you find, the only purpose there is for life is found in Christ. Where do you turn when you're empty? 
when you're looking for satisfaction? And lastly, where do you turn when you're looking for validation? You're looking for somebody to say, hey, man, I, I like your haircut. Man, you take 1,257 selfies, you pick the one you like, you edit it ever so slightly, you post that baby online and you wait. Got 47 likes, 10 minutes. It's not even, it's not even real. Um, I remember I was appointed, I was practicing law a few years ago, and I was appointed to represent this lady, and I didn't know who she was, and uh, uh, not in this county, another county. And I uh, appointed to represent this lady, so I went to people from the court, I said, I'm looking for this lady, and they said, uh, oh, Oh, she doesn't look like that. <laughs> said, the lady you're looking for is sitting over on the third row. You're right, she don't look like that. Uh, you're looking for validation. People, it's all about the social media and how many likes that they get. I mean, it's driving our whole society. It's, and they base their self-worth based on what's out there. So much so. I know of a preacher, supposed to be a true story. Everything I know about is true. He was holding a, a revival. He went to preach and he went out to eat with this couple from church. And uh, they were about to eat and a little girl, a little girl there, uh, seven, eight years old. And uh, they, she, said, uh, she said, I'd like to pray for supper. And she did. Had a good prayer, prayed for supper. And when she got done praying, she said, uh, Mom, aren't you going to post that? <laughs> then her mom said, that's a good idea. And she got her phone out of her purse and she said, here, honey, act like you're praying. She didn't pray twice. She just acted like she was praying. She took a picture of it and she posted it. And people were saying, uh, they were commenting on the photo, hashtag mom goals. If only my daughter would pray at lunch, pray at dinner. That's, that's serious. That stuff's happening. We, we've become, narcissism is the new norm. It's what people expect. It's, it's normal. We're experts at the humble brag. It's like we're, we're taking the weekend off because I made my, my son who was on the all-state uh, golf team he was one of 12 people was uh you know elected to participate in this golf team we've been out of the country all year playing golf i said son this week we're taking off it's a humble brag i'd like to be on time but i couldn't get Susie out of the house because she's a little mozart on that piano let me tell you what i'm doing the best i can to be on time she, she's so gifted we're experts at it and the whole thing's not even real um there was a guy, true story, from uh, New York Times. He had over 700, over 700 uh, friends on social media, 700 Facebook friends. And he decided he was going to throw a party for all of his Facebook friends. So he did. Just down from his apartment, there was a, uh, there was a bar. And he's going to throw a party at the bar for all of his Facebook friends. He had uh, 15 people said they were going. 15 people. 60 people said maybe. He went there, he showed up, he got everything ready to go for the party. One person showed up. And it was a friend of a friend who thought somebody else was going to be there. <laughs> showed up and talked awkwardly for a minute and then left. And, and he posted at the end of the night, he said, he said, 700 friends and here I sit in a bar drinking all alone. It's not even real. I mean, you've got to consider, where do you turn for validation? Consider what the Bible's saying to us. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37, verse 4, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Look at what the Bible's saying. Only God can. We're looking at all these other places, all these other places for satisfaction. And it's, it's a joke. The whole thing's not real. It's a facade. Consider this. Can't you see well, we say here every week at East Point, almost every week, I don't know, there's two things we do every week. We read this verse and we shout. We ain't shouted yet. And the Bible does say in Psalm 100 verse 1, it does say, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Woo! Yeah. So we done a shout. Now, the second thing we do about every week is we, we reinstate. Uh, we restate. Uh, reaffirm what Jesus said was the most important of all the commandments. And Jesus said this is the first commandment and the greatest. In Mark 12, verse 30, Jesus said this. He said, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I just want to ask you, if that's legitimate, and we talk about it all the time, if, if we don't keep the first and greatest commandment, does it matter if we keep any of the others? Does it matter? Is your church attendance going to matter? Is your baptismal certificate going to matter if you don't love God most and first? Does anything else matter if we don't keep the first and greatest commandment first and greatest? 
Now consider. If you love God, truly love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let me ask you just, just five questions. If you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what would you consistently sacrifice your time for? What do you think? If you love God most, then what's the first thing you would think about in the morning when you get up? If you really love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, where would you turn for comfort when you're hurting? If you love God most, where would you turn for satisfaction when you feel empty? If you love God most, then where would you turn for validation? You see, uh, Google's glad that you're asking, what's the best haircut for me? What's the best job? What's the next step I should take in my life? But actually, God holds tomorrow. And through Christ, we are children, Christian. You're Christian. You're children of God. And he wants us, instead of asking, hey, Siri, and hey, Google, he's wanting us to go to him in prayer. Go to your room, your closet, private space. The word closet occurs in the NIV in Matthew 6. And close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God, God just wants our, he wants our hearts. And you gotta, you, as you consider in, in life every day, of all things that God can do, He's over all, through all, and in all. He's mighty to save. He's the King of glory. The price for sin has been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those who trust, praise the Lord, those who trust and obey, their sins are gone, they're forgiven, they're heaven bound. Don't you know? There are many mansions in my Father's house. To be absent from the body, help me out, is to be present with the Lord. And all the victory of who God is and what He offers, can't you see? We're turning, we're exchanging the glory of God for a glowing rectangle. It's so, it's so simple. It's so profound. And, and I'm guilty. I spend, I'm able to spend, I drive a lot, I listen to Bible while I drive and things like that. I'm able to spend some time studying the Bible. But I could spend a lot more time studying the Bible if I wasn't on this telephone. And I may not be the only one guilty of that. I, I'd probably make time for, for checking on other people if I wasn't so much checking on social media. I'd probably make time to have conversation with people, with somebody else, if I wasn't just wasting time on YouTube. Am I the only one guilty? We consider, see, what, what's most important. I'm not, the phone in and of itself is not bad. And, and all the stuff, it's amazing what we're, we have access to at our fingertips. That in and of itself is not bad. It's only when it supersedes what we should be doing, which is... Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I want to say uh, as we close here, uh, one way to uh, conquer evil is this. Romans 12, verse 20, overcome evil with good. Now, uh, as, you study about, as you study the Bible, you study the Old Testament and what happened through the Old Testament, um, down through Moses leading children out, down through the kingdoms, uh, northern kingdom, southern kingdom of Israel, the exile, the uh, Assyrian exile first in the north, the Babylonian exile in the south. You, you study all that history. You study, you get to the last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, and you see that from the end of Malachi to the first of Matthew, there's 400 years. We call that the silent period. 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New. And we say, well, God was silent, and he was. There are no prophets, there are no angelic encounters. There was just silence for 400 years. But as you study world history, after the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians, then came the Greeks. And the Greeks conquered the world. And that guy's name, when he was so great, they just call him Alexander the Great. And he conquered the world. And everybody then, after the Greek Empire, everybody could speak a little Greek. There was a common language to some degree. Moreover, they had, a, they had a highway system that people could travel on highways, places and distances they could have never made in a short period of time before. They had highways and they had a language. Everything was said. When the Roman Empire came to power, the Greeks had, had fallen away. The Roman Empire came to power with this language and with this roadway system. Everything was said to facilitate the spreading of the greatest message the world will ever know. And that's why the New Testament was originally written in Greek. 
And that's how the apostles were able to travel to preach. Everything was just perfect at just the right time. When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Everything was perfect and God pulled it off. Can you see? You overcome evil with good. In the last 25 years, we have a highway like none other before. What we do, Jonathan puts these messages online, and you know if you go to uh, uh, Taiwan or uh, anywhere else, if you can get access to the Internet, you can catch sermons right here at East Point. We can run missionary uh, mission, missions around the world. We can run it from your home office. We have a highway like never before. We can use this internet stuff. We can use it for good, not evil. And we can do this thing to share the gospel of Christ. It's not all bad. iPhones are not bad. Uh, just use them for good and not for evil. It's a new highway. Everything's ready for the second coming. Everything, the gospel's being spread. You realize, true story. People without food and water around the planet, truthfully, they don't have food and water, but they do have smartphones. I know a missionary went to Papua New Guinea. And, and there they didn't, have, they didn't have food to eat in villages. But they all had smartphones. What they didn't have was electricity to charge the phone. So they'd turn it on, they'd make a call, they'd turn it off again. They'd ride three hours on a bus to get to town, plug it in, get juice. But they had phones. The gospel's able to spread because this highway, let's use it for good, not for evil. Spiritual growth, you can study your Bible on the telephone. That's all right. You can study commentaries. You can read Christian books. You can do it on the telephone. You can let your light shine for Christ on the telephone, on your iPad, on your computer, whatever it is you use. Use it for good, not for evil. Today is the day of salvation. John wrote to the church and he said, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's where we started this morning. Your phone, what's in your pocket, what's in your purse, it could very much become an idol if you let it. Otherwise, it's a tool that you can use for the glory of God. Today's the day of salvation. If you want to become a Christian, then you have that opportunity today to be saved. Realizing sin's paid for, paid in full, you can be washed in the blood of Christ, believing that He is the Son of God, repenting of your sin. The word repentance means change your heart. You can confess with your lips that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you can be buried with Him. All of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. The only reason you're baptized into the death of Christ is because of when they pierced His side at Calvary, out came blood and water. Water can't save anybody, but the blood of Christ, obedience to the Word of God, will save your soul. You can be buried with Christ spiritually. Your sins are washed away. I can't make this kind of stuff. I could make it up. I'd be wrong. The Bible says it. Arise, be baptized, and wash your sins away. Water can't do that. Only the blood of Christ. Only obedience to the word of God. You can go on your way rejoicing. We want to encourage you to keep that first commandment first and greatest. We want to encourage you all the way to the gates of glory. As our time here on earth is short. If you want to become a Christian, rededicate your life, any decision you have, you want us to pray with you, pray for you. As we all 